book of Ezekiel, one of the five major prophets. Only major because of the volume of material that they wrote, uh, not because they were more significant than the minor prophets. And we find uh, where that we're in chapter 28. Having looked in chapters 1 through 24 at the pre-prophesied fall of Jerusalem and Judah and uh, written five or six years before the actual event and then fulfilled as prophecy said they would be. And then in chapters 25 through 32, we find the prophecy of cities who are pagan nations that... Uh, uh, nations that have been uh, a thorn in the side of Israel, uh, ones that mock because Israel had claimed to have the only living God, and uh, now God has made a prophecy about the destruction of each of these cities. And uh, while there is some debate about the, the completeness of the prophecy, I think the very story that we've already looked at of Alexander the Great sieging Tyre and scraping the ruins into the sea completely fulfills that prophecy, even though there is, again, a city of Tyre. Uh, it is nothing like the previous city, and it is not a continuation of the city that existed uh, during biblical times. So the prophecy was fulfilled. Nothing can prevent, uh, well, I shouldn't say nothing. God can do whatever he wants to, but uh, nothing prevented uh, some small village cropping up where the city of Tyre once was. The same thing is true of Sidon. And so we find that uh, while you can find cities there now, there's no doubt that they were devastated, as the Bible said they would be, in fulfilling the prophecy. And uh, we can easily go to those cities and see that uh, they are very small, uh, not prospering in a significant way. Um, nevertheless, during the biblical days prior to Christ's birth, uh, the prophecy was totally fulfilled. So I think it's important for us to remember that. So actually the destruction of Tyre is uh, covered in both chapters 26 and 27 and goes on into the beginning of chapter 28 where the prophet is told to go tell the king of Tyre uh, that he will be judged uh, because he has considered himself a god wiser than Daniel and he's rich and proud and uh, certainly in a joyful uh, about the fall of Jerusalem and uh, Judah. So let's take a look at uh, a couple of key verses. Let's take a look at verse 6 and see what uh, Ezekiel uh, was said to tell the king of Tyre. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most ruthless of all the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. Well, we know that that happened. And then as we continue in chapter 28, we see the judgment of Sidon. Uh, we see again uh, that there's a prophecy that they would experience pestilence, blood, and uh, that there would be uh, great annihilation in the uh, nation. And that, of course, happened almost simultaneously with Tyre. And the fact that Alexander the Great uh, had to, because only had to go 25 miles north to Sidon, uh, he went up there and took Sidon before he finished his siege of Tyre. And uh, all of the pestilence and blood in the streets and things that were prophesied there did come to pass. Uh, Sidon does still exist, uh, but just as a small, nasty, dirty village. And... Uh, Certainly, again, we can claim the prophecy fulfilled completely, even though there is now a city of Sidon uh, some uh, 2,500 years later. Uh, people have rebuilt a small village there. But take a look at what God said about this nation in verse 26. They will live insecurely and they will build houses and plant vineyards and live securely 
and then I will execute judgments upon all who scorn them around about them. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. That was probably unfair that I jumped that many verses ahead, but he's not talking about Sidon or Tyre here. He's talking about regathering the nation of Israel from all of the nations that they've been scattered in and reestablishing them in the land and giving them a security in that land. And that's exactly what's happened to the nation of Israel. They've been regathered from all of the nations that they've been scattered to, and they live securely because, you know what, in spite of the fact that they have a great deal of strength themselves, uh, they also have America, which has been constantly their friend and constantly protecting their existence. And you say, well, that's putting all of the credit on America. No, God caused America to do that. Uh, God is the one that put up that hedge around that little nation of Israel, uh, a very unlikely event. Most big nations wouldn't care about a little nation like Israel. They don't have a lot of resources that we need or anything else. So why? Well, because of God. God intervenes and he intervene, intervenes politically, he intervenes in all kinds of historical ways. And so we shouldn't be surprised that God's on his throne. We shouldn't be surprised that the prophecies that he foretells all come to pass. And he's told us that there is an end. There is a day of judgment coming when he'll have to create a new heaven and a new earth. And he tells us that we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ and come and live eternally with him. That's a great promise. And if you've never made that claim, if you've never turned from your sins and accepted Jesus as your savior, you need to just like, take a look at some of these prophecies, hundreds of them that have come to pass exactly as God said they would. And my friends, the prophecy of a coming end and a judgment, boy, the signs of the times are everywhere. Read in the New Testament about the signs towards the end of this world as we know it, and you'll see that we're there. We're calling good evil, and we're calling evil good, just as he said we would in the end times. The sound of the trumpet can't be far away. Now, before I close this video, I want to ask you to pray for a very dear friend of mine. His name is Jeff Spell. He's fighting for his life in Tampa General Hospital. His heart has stopped now in the last few days three times. Uh, the first time was after surgery and was not terribly unexpected uh, because of all of the trauma they'd put him through for brain surgery. Uh, but last night he suffered two more heart stoppages and he's back in intensive care after looking at the possibility of going home on the 5th of September. Uh, and the therapy was coming along well. He was making good progress and it uh, looked like the type of cancer he had could be treated with exactly the same treatments that they used with Jimmy Carter and that his prognosis for a future was really good. But right now he needs your prayers. I don't know what God's will is. God hasn't spoken to me specifically about Jeff, except that he's put a real burden on my heart to ask everybody that I know to pray for him. So would you stop right now and pray for Jeff Spell, Tampa General Hospital, and ask God if it could be possible that he might extend his days and they'd be quality days where he can continue to witness and serve God. I, I just ask you to be with that whole family in prayer. Pray for Karen and the children continued that they're grown children, married grown children, but pray for their families. Jeff is a great man, loves the Lord with all of his heart, has done a lot of things for a lot of churches, and he needs our prayers right now. So I hope that you'll do that. God bless you. That's my thought for the day.